Host, host, host.
Hi guys, if you could all take a seat for me, we're gonna go ahead and get started with our bi-weekly rounds video, and then we'll just jump right into our general meeting. Please make sure that you put away any phones or laptops or homework or anything like that, and make sure that you have a mask on, please. Hello, BMSA. My name is Maddie. And I'm Adley. And we are this week's host for Bi-Weekly Rounds. Believe it or not, we are over halfway through the semester, so be sure to get your points to stay active. from our guest speaker for tonight, let's take it on over to our officers to hear about some great events coming up. Hello, my name is Sarah Jones and I'm serving as the BMSA president this year. I want to start by saying how incredibly glad I am to be back on campus and surrounded by such a great group of pre-health students. BMSA is working hard to provide you with all of the resources and opportunities you need in order to be successful in your undergraduate career. An important change within our organization this year is our move back to in-person activities. There is nothing like being in a room with all of your peers, and we are incredibly grateful for this opportunity. In order to keep all of these events in person, it is up to us as members of BMSA to encourage safe and responsible gatherings. That is why BMSA is requiring masks at all events this semester. Masks are an incredibly effective way to mitigate the spread of illness, especially COVID-19. If you do not have a mask, please raise your hand and an officer will provide you with one. Failure to comply with our masking policy will result in you not receiving points for this event. Also, I would like to thank everyone for putting away all phones, laptops, and homework to give your full attention to the guest speaker. Now, I hope you all get excited for what we have to offer this semester. I'll now hand it off to our executive board members who have been putting so much work into creating educational and engaging activities this semester. Hey everyone, I'm Joy, your service chair. This week, like always, we have a ton of service opportunities for you to attend. So check out the Google sign up form and sign up. Make sure to get those service points in before the end of the semester. And remember, if you sign up for an event, it's a commitment, so you must attend. Also, even though it's a few weeks away, on November 5th, we have a large service opportunity, which can be 10 points, which is two thirds of the points you need. So check out the Google form and sign up if you're interested. Hi, I'm Natalie. I'm the Research and Internship Chair of BMSA, and I just wanted to update y'all on some of the cool workshops that we have coming up in the next two weeks. So starting tomorrow, October 20th, we have a Trauma 101 workshop, which is great if you want to learn a little bit about triaging, maybe the ABCs of trauma, things like that. Um, on Thursday, we have Research and Medical Ethics, which is great if you're interested in getting into research. And then on a Sunday, we have surgical skills like normal, um, but we are doing general emergencies and intubation. Definitely check that out if you want to get some hands-on skills, but those are limited events, so be sure to sign up as early as you can, and we'll have a random selection of people who can go to that. And then next Monday, we have on October 25th, we have Pharmacology 101. So that one is great if you want to learn a little bit about medications, maybe if you have some sort of interest in pharmacology, definitely check that out. And then on Tuesday, this one um, we used to have a few years ago, but on October 27th, we have a Stop the Bleed workshop. And that one's really great if you want a certification that you can put on your resume. So from the American College of Surgeons um, and Department of Homeland Security, you get a Stop the Bleed certificate that, again, you can put on your resume. And we will have a member from the Emergency Management Department here at Baylor come and train you. And on Monday, we have a MD dual degree workshop, which is great if you want to learn about some of the dual degree programs you can have in medical school. So be sure to check all of those out on the sign up form and hope to see you there. Hello, BMSA. My name is Danny Grape, and I'm the vice president this year. I just want to remind you guys that we have one-on-one -on -one mentoring available um, pretty much every day of the week. You just got to sign up on the event sign-up form and in the weekly email. And every 
Uh, alternating Tuesday, we have mentorship socials in the BSB atrium with free food and a chance to talk about uh, any advice you may need with upperclassmen mentors. So go ahead and check that out on the event sign up form as well. And I will see you guys after the meeting. Hi everyone, my name is Sydney Young. Hey guys, I'm Justin. So our submission for the winter break mission trip to the Rio Grande Valley has closed. But you have two more opportunities this year for mission trips. Another one to, uh, to the RGV over at spring break and an international one to Guatemala in the summer. We really hope you apply and please let me or Sydney know if you have any questions. Additionally, we have plenty of workshops coming up for you guys this next week to get you guys engaged in global health. Our first one's gonna be for the clinical skills workshop on Wednesday, October 20th from five to 6 p.m. And then right after that, the World Health Organization workshop, also on Wednesday, on Wednesday, October 20th from 6 to 7 p.m. And then Healthcare Around the World on Thursday, October 21st from 6.30 to 7.30. We hope to see you guys there. Thank you. Hey guys, it's Pardis, your fundraising chair. I have some exciting news. General member shirts are finally here. So after the meeting, go to the front of B110 and show a fundraising member your confirmation of paying dues located in your email. Lastly, BMSA crewnecks are available to purchase on the BMSA website under the stores tab. So go and get one while they're in stock. Thank you. Hey guys, it's George, your social chair. I just want to remind you all of a couple of social events coming up. On Wednesday next week, we have two social events. There's social workshop at 4 p.m. in room C231, which comes for your academic workshops, workshop points. And then on the same day at 6 p.m., there's small groups in B105, which comes for your general points. Then on Friday, there's medical TV show night in room E234, which also comes for your general points. Finally, right after this meeting, we have our post-meeting social outside the BSV atrium, and there will be pizza. Looking forward to seeing you guys there. Well, that's all for us tonight, guys. Make sure to fill out the Google form to get your points, email the officers if you have any questions, and follow us on social media at BMSA underscore BU to keep up with all of the fun. Enjoy the meeting. All right, thank you guys so much for your attention. Now um, I'm gonna introduce Pardis. She's currently serving as our fundraising chair and she's also our representative at Baylor for Kaplan. So we are partnered with Kaplan, which is a test prep service company. So if you're looking to take a test like the MCAT or the GRE or any sort of um, you know, post-secondary schooling test, Pardis is here to tell you about um, the benefits of using Kaplan. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, my name is Pardee Shasavari. I'm a senior health science studies major and I'm minoring in leadership and biology. And today I'll be talking about Kaplan test prep. So if you don't know, Kaplan is a world leader in test preparation. We have MCAT resources, LSAT, GRE, GMAT, anything we have it. But today we're mainly going to be talking about what we have for the MCAT. Okay, so a really awesome benefit about being a part of BMSA is that you get a club discount. And so if you, at the end of this, wanna go and purchase any Kaplan courses or books, you'll get 10% off by using Baylor 10. And so you can go on the website, www.captest.com, or you can also call 1-800-CAPTEST. And then you'll also get resources like Kaplan teachers, and then also a free pop quiz and study guide, which I will get into on the next slide. Okay, so if you're going to listen to anything that I say today, this is definitely the most important slide. So right here, you can get out your phones and I'll give everyone a minute, um, but you can scan the QR or you can also go on Snapchat and scan too. And once you do that, you'll sign up, you'll write your name, your email, um, what year you are and what um, tests you'll be taking. So most of you guys will either be doing MCAT or GRE if you're pre-PA. And so you'll scan it and then you'll take a really short, like four question quiz. And then after that, you'll be emailed in 24 hours a free um, study guide. And I'll still have the QR on the next slide too, if you haven't scanned yet. So in this study guide, you'll get a 24 page, like very concise um, study guide that covers biology, 
biochem, chemistry, physics, psychology, and sociology. And I know if you're a freshman or a sophomore, you might not think that um, this presentation today is as useful since you're not studying for the MCAT yet. But this study guide actually helps a lot with classes. Like right now I'm in abnormal psychology and a lot of the things on here in the psychology section, I'm still going over. Or if you're struggling in biochem, we have a lot of nice concise notes that help you memorize everything as well. So if you scan this and do that really quick, that'd be really awesome. Okay, so really quickly, here's a medical school admissions timeline. Um, between January to April, you'll be prepping for the MCAT. And I know that not everyone does it exactly this way. So this is just like a general timeline. And so most students will spend about 300 hours preparing and will usually take over three to four months. And then after you're prepared for your application by getting rec letters, your score and your personal statement draft between January to July as well. And then you'll start your primary application, which you'd want to submit before June because it's a rolling admissions process. So the earlier that you submit your application, the better. And then ideally like to submit your secondary applications two weeks after that. And then you'll have interviews about August all the way to February, March, and then you'll get your acceptance offers after that. So really quick, this is kind of what the MCAT goes over. There are four sections and you'll get roughly about 59 questions and you'll get 90 to 95 minutes per section as well. So there's a chemistry and physics section. There's a critical analysis and reasoning skills, CARS for short. And we actually don't have a book over that because what you would do is um, you would just read the passages and answer the questions accordingly. And then we have a biology and biochem section and then a psych and sociology section. So for this entire test, you'll be sitting for about seven and a half hours, which I know is a really long time. But if you go through Kaplan, you'll have tons of practice and it'll get a lot easier. So why Kaplan? We have a ton of course options that you can do because I know everybody learns differently. Um, you can just purchase the test bundles, which would come with the practice packs, Q banks, and more starting at 199. We have a live online um, class that you can join, which is basically like a synchronous class. Um, if you're familiar with that with Zoom and everything. So you'll get on at a certain time, two to three times a week, and you'll have a Kaplan teacher there guiding you with everything. And then there's a little chat box that you can go and ask questions in. So it's live. And then there's an on-demand course, which you can do asynchronously. So if times aren't really your thing, you can watch it at any point of the day, really helpful. And then we also have one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And so if you have any more questions or wanna know more about it, you can scan that QR as well. And then if you purchase a Kaplan course, what it includes is 700 hours of total instruction and practice. You'll get 15 full-length practice tests an adaptive QBank and MCAT channel, which I'll get into. And then you'll have the most available AMC practice material. If you don't know, AMC is who makes the exam, the MCAT. And so whatever they have on the website, we'll also provide that just so you know about it. And then it comes with the seven book MCAT subject review set. So something that we have, like I talked about before, is the MCAT channel. Basically what it is, is that there are a bunch of videos that you can join live if you're struggling over a certain topic, let's say um, optics with physics, there are kind of like 30 minute live session videos that go really into detail about it. And cause I know sometimes you'll read the books and it won't really make as much sense instead of being taught to. So you can go, it's led by a teacher. And then if you can't join live, they're also recorded as well, which is really helpful. And then we have a QBank as well. Basically, um, there are a bunch of quizzes that are adapted to you. So it knows um, what you know well and what you don't know too well. And then it will ask you questions accordingly. And the best part about all of this is that if you see that Kaplan doesn't help you as much, you can get your money back. So what you would do is take an initial di diagnostic test and then see what your score is. And then at the end of Kaplan, you see that your score isn't better than that. Then you could go to captest.com slash HSG. And then also we're actually hiring right now. 
Um, so if you want to apply and like do what I do and like work with me, then you can do so. Come and talk to me after this meeting and I can give you more information. There are a lot of perks about being a student brand ambassador. It's a lot of fun um, and it's very flexible, which is really important too. So if you, if anyone's interested, like please come and find me and then I can give you more info. So that is all I have. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, so if you think of anything, just email me right here, or you can also come up to me at the end. And then here's the QR again, if you didn't get to do that. But yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. All right, if you guys haven't scanned the QR code already and input your information, please do that. Um, having more interaction as an organization is gonna be really helpful for us to get further scholarships um, or partnerships with Kaplan, which will in turn benefit you as members. So if you didn't get to scan this QR code yet, please do so now. Okay. Okay, um, one thing that I wanna let you guys know, you do need 15 service points to get active status for this semester. Um, if that makes you a little bit nervous, have no fear. We have plenty of large service events coming up. So these are not gonna be limited events. So if you sign up, you're going to get a spot. Um, these events are Trunk or Treat at Heinz Elementary. That's October 28th. It's a very cute event. You can see all the little kids dressed up, give out some candy. It's a really great event. The 5K for Rwanda, um, we mentioned it in bi-weekly rounds, but that's gonna be Friday, November 5th. And if Friday doesn't, doesn't work well for you, the next morning we have Steppin' Out um, from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. And the deadline to sign up for Steppin' Out is October 25th. You have to get approval from student activities before you can um, participate in Steppin' Out. So you have to decide sooner rather than later um, if you're gonna go ahead and participate in that. And just a reminder that you need 15 service points, which is three hours of service by the end of the semester. Okay, now I'm gonna have George, our social chair, come up and tell you about a new event that we have coming up. Hey guys, uh, so BMSA is actually teaming up with other pre-health orgs this semester and we're doing uh, intramural sports. So I have a QR code and there's also the link but the QR code is obviously a lot easier to do. So if you are interested in participating in intramural sports with other pre-health org, orgs, please uh, use that and um, sign up and, yeah, thank you very much. Hey guys, my name is Danny. I'm the vice president. Um, I've introduced myself many times, but come talk to me afterwards. I wanna to get to know you guys. So tonight we have a guest speaker, uh, Dr. Holland. Dr. Holland is a, I don't know how to say that word. I'm just gonna say ENT in Waco, Texas, where he has practiced for over 19 years. He actually, uh, was my doctor at one point for one procedure. Anyways, he is the immediate past president of the Texas Association of ENT and is the speaker of Texas Medical Association House of Delegates. He is board certified in head and neck surgery by the American Academy of ENT and is a fellow and diplomat of the American College of Surgeons. Dr. Holland has a long time dedication to the musical arts and is a medical advisor to the Central Texas Choral Society, as well as past president of the Waco Symphony Association. And with that, I give you guys Dr. Holland. See if that works. Can you hear me? Is that on? That sounds all right. Okay. We'll try it that way. Thank you, Danny. Uh, yeah, he ad admitted that uh, I have. Uh, treated him in the past and he was kind enough to forgive me and ask me back to do something like this. So uh, I appreciate the invite. And, and uh, let me tell you, since I was elected speaker of the Texas Medical Association House in, in May, I've spent most of my time talking with physicians, uh, occasionally doing some press things, but uh, it's very nice to be back. I don't get it often to uh, speak with students, uh, medical students or, or pre-med students. And so it's very exciting to me to see this room with uh, young and vivacious and energetic people who are excited and motivated, and uh, it's, it's an honor for me to uh, be here to, to speak with you tonight. Uh, this is not a talk I've given a lot. Uh, I have no notes tonight. I'm just sort of uh, giving you a little bit about my path and, and how I got here and uh, a little bit about ENT, um, and then uh, be happy to take some, some questions. So we'll see how the timing works out, but uh, um, I'm originally from Colorado. Um, let's see you there. I uh, was born in, uh, in Boulder and raised in Estes Park, believe it or not, uh, and then went to the University of Colorado, go Buffs, uh, for undergraduate. And uh, I was a molecular biology and biochemistry dual major uh, at University of Colorado. 
I can recall sitting in the pre-medical uh, society at uh, CU, uh, very much as you all are, although I can tell you your society has some 10 times more than what we had back then. Uh, uh, I can see why you attend these things. I, my society at CU is not quite as uh, well organized nor uh, as, as uh, rewarding to attend. And I sat in the back and I was not exactly as much a contributing member, but uh, thinking I didn't fit in very much with a lot of the people there, I, I didn't know why, I just was uh, a little bit more introverted, I guess, at that stage. Uh, had I attended more of those, I probably would have known that there was actually even a prep course for the MCAT, which I didn't even know they existed. I, I got a book and read that and took the MCAT. And uh, I'll have to tell you that uh, I, I perseverated over the score. I mean, I was dead set on getting a high score. And to this day, I couldn't tell you what I got on it. I just don't remember. So while it is important and, and while uh, you do want to do well and you want to prepare, uh, I can guarantee you that at some point in your career, whether you become uh, a physician or whether you don't, that their MCAT score won't matter anymore. So, uh, so we've got to keep that in mind as you uh, progress through too. Um, but uh, <clears throat> so I was on a full scholarship at CU Boulder. Uh, my parents were both teachers. I didn't come from a medical family. Um, and so then paying for medical school was uh, a, a bit of an issue. And, and uh, I shopped around and interviewed for a lot of schools. Uh, originally, I was going to go MD, PhD, and, uh, and there was one reason I really wanted to do that. I did have quite a bit of uh, science in my background and done quite a bit of research in, in my undergraduate. Um, but I found out that medical school is free if you went for MD, PhD, and you, you were actually paid to be a student uh, rather than pay uh, tuition. So I thought that sounded like a pretty good deal. And so I applied to MD, PhD programs uh, throughout the sort of the South and Southwest and, and uh, Eventually settled on, uh, brought down to uh, Washington, St. Louis and, and UT Southwestern in Dallas and uh, went uh, many places to interview, but interviewed both those places and decided that I wanted to go to, to UT Southwestern. So I started at UT Southwestern as a uh, MD, PhD student, but uh, very shortly thereafter, I realized that I did not want to spend that long in school. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do that. Their medical scientist program is an amazing program, but uh, um, but I really wanted to go out and practice, I, I figured, and, and I wanted to be a practicing physician. And I didn't think that PhD portion was necessary if you weren't going to be highly in academics, which I would still commend to you to this day, unless you're going to be a, a highly centered academician, there's really not a point of being an MD, PhD in private practice. Uh, so I dropped the PhD and, and uh, figured out a way to finance the rest of medical school, went into debt uh, to some degree, but not, not huge debt. Uh, I did have in-state tuition uh, to UT Southwestern as a scholarship there. and. Uh, and so I um, started out, uh, did my uh, medical school at UT Southwestern uh, and quite a place. I, I, uh, I didn't actually know a lot about uh, uh, all the Texas schools and all the interplay that go on with them. Uh, one you know, one pe person says this about one, one person says this about another. I, I, I was ignorant of all that, but, uh, um, but I, it's, it's better to be lucky than good sometimes. And I lucked into, I think, a very good medical school. Uh, I haven't regretted attending UT Southwestern uh, one bit. But when I started there, I, I thought I was going to be an OB-GYN. My, my distant uncle, who I didn't know well, was an OB-GYN. And so I thought that was sort of our family tradition. And that's what I would do. And, and uh, um, back in those days, you really didn't get much clinical uh, attention or didn't get into the clinic really until your third year, which I think they changed at most schools now. But uh, Starting my third year rotation, first clinical uh, at Parkland Hospital, of course, which has one of the largest OB programs in the, the country. Uh, uh, I hated it. I mean, I, I hated uh, every bit of, of OB-GYN. Uh, not to say that it's a bad specialty, but I just didn't like it. I almost thought about uh, dropping out of medical school because I, I hated it so much. I built it up to be this great thing that I was gonna, gonna be an OB-GYN deliver babies. And, and uh, I just didn't like any part of it. I delivered 11 babies. Uh, those uh, 10 weeks of, of OB-GYN in my first third year, and then had a um, kind of come to Jesus moment about what am I doing and what do I want to do? And, and, uh, and it had never actually occurred to me uh, to be a surgeon. I just sort of thought that you had to be something, uh, either had family members, most people wanted to be surgeons, had family members that were surgeons. And, and uh, uh, it was this mental block in my own mind that uh, I, you know, surgery was something else for, for people that were not first time doctors or the only doctor in the family per se. And when I got past that and realized, well, that's silly, uh, then all of a sudden a whole new world opened up to me and I did trauma surgery, uh, which, uh, you know, at Parkland, uh, I don't know how many of you know, that's, uh, I was uh, very close to the old trauma room where John F. Kennedy died, that's trauma room one. Um, 
where uh, uh, he was taken that day and there's still a plaque up. There was when I was there and that's the plaque. I think it's still there, although I think it's moved now again. Um, but uh, how many of you have seen the movie Parkland? About the JFK thing, no one has. Uh, uh, well, I commend it to you. If, if you know, there's a, a, the, the first physician who was the young intern to, to treat John F. Kennedy was a man named James Carrico. And he went on to become the chair of surgery at, at Parkland and he was my mentor. Uh, um, made a very big impression on me. Uh, now, the funny thing about Dr. Carrico is that in the movie, uh, Zac Efron plays uh, Dr. Carrico. Uh, he didn't really look very much like Zac Efron, but, uh, um, but Dr. Carrico was my mentor uh, and talked me into uh, surgery. Um, and I had a, a very close relationship with him. And, uh, and I would encourage you to do that all really along your, your whole path is to try and find mentors, people who uh, uh, look and do things that you want to do, uh, try and get to know them, learn from them. Uh, I think mentoring is such an important part of every step of your process. So uh, I would encourage that very much. He was uh, a mentor to me. Um, eventually we got talking and, and UT Southwestern did not have a pre-surgery club. You know, in medical school, there's not a whole lot of clubs that we have intramural sports and, and things like that. But uh, there was the pre-psychiatry and pre-everything else, but there was no pre-surgery. So uh, so I started the pre-surgery society called the Wilson Society at Southwestern, and uh, that still exists to this day for students interested in going into surgery so that you get a little bit more exposure. Um, and, <clears throat> and then I uh, tried to figure out what to, to match in at that point. I was all set up. I was going to be a neurosurgeon. I figured uh, that was really exciting to me. Southwestern was a big neurosurgery uh, uh, referral center, and it was really one of the places where aneurysm clipping was still... Uh, still done, vascular neurosurgery. A lot of other places are going up endoscopically and doing coils, but, but some aneurysms you just can't do that with. And so there weren't very many centers that were still doing major aneurysm clipping, but, but Southwestern was one. And I thought that was just the coolest thing in the world. Um, and so I did three neurosurgery clerkships and I had all my letters and did all my interviews and, and, uh, and could have written my ticket in neurosurgery. And, and just before the time it was in the, the end of my third year, uh, I got to talking with, again, another mentor, um, and he said, uh, you want to go out and be in private practice? And I said, yeah. And he said, uh, well, you can't clip aneurysms out in private practice. That's, that's something only the big medical schools do. And uh, I, it never really occurred to me for that. And, and uh, I got to looking at it, and, and frankly, 99% of people who are in neurosurgery out in private practice end up dealing with back operations and, and back pain. And that was something I just had absolutely zero interest in. And so I started thinking, uh, well, what else is up in this area that I could do? And uh, I'd been teaching, uh, I worked my way through medical school to being anatomy TA. So I, I taught in the anatomy lab and head and neck anatomy was always my favorite. And, uh, and so I sort of switched over to thinking maybe I'll do the front half of the head instead of the, the back half of the head. And, and, uh, and that's when the world of ENT opened up to me. And so uh, I was not nearly as well set up uh, to go into ENT. Um, I had to scramble to do two clerkships and, and uh, get letters. And, uh, and most people told me I was crazy to try and, and get into ENT that late. Uh, uh, it's actually tougher to get into ENT than neurosurgery back then. And I think it still is, but, uh, um, but ENT was one of the top five most competitive up there with uh, dermatology and orthopedics. And, and uh, it was tough to scramble into, but I, I did. And, and so, uh, so then uh, entered the world of uh, otolaryngology, which uh, is quite a varied world. And, uh, and matched uh, at a program, uh, Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I did my internship at uh, uh, Bowman Gray School of Medicine at North Carolina Baptist Hospital, which at the time was uh, uh, one of the top 10 uh, size-wise hospitals in North Carolina. And, uh, and then uh, my ENT at Wake Forest. Um, you know, believe it or not, uh, Bowman Gray, does anybody know who Bowman Gray was? Roman Gray was the president of R.J. Reynolds Tobacco. And uh, so it's tobacco money that paid for that hospital. And uh, the hospital actually handed out free cigarettes in the lobby until just a few years before I got there. Uh, 1988 was the last time they, they uh, handed out free cigarettes uh, in the hospital lobby. And I started in uh, uh, 1997, so uh, just a few, few years on. But you can imagine that uh, uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, there's even a cigarette named after the town, is a pretty good place to do head and neck cancer and head and neck uh, surgery, just because there's a lot of tobacco use, and a lot of head and neck cancer. And it also had one, at the time, there were five major voice centers uh, in the United States, and this had a voice center. And, uh, 
at the time that was a benefit. I wasn't super interested in, in vocal uh, surgery and tonal surgery, um, but that's what uh, looked good to me. And so I went out to the world of, of ear, nose and throat and started there. Uh, ENT, and I'll talk a little bit about that, uh, is really, uh, it's, it's a chimera. It's, it's a whole bunch of specialties that are put into one. And if you go back a hundred years, almost all of these were, were separate and some of them still are. Uh, but you had head and neck surgery that were people who were taking care of cancer. You had people who were dealing with swallowing, the bronchoesophagology. You had people who were nose doctors, people who were operating on skull base and ear. You had ear surgeons, the otologists, had allergy, uh, those that took care of kids, some facial plastic surgery, and finally just, just laryngology. And all that's been kind of uh, morphed into one specialty. So. Uh, it's a very varied specialty, and, and uh, uh, no matter what you do uh, in ENT, I can tell you that no one is good at, at all those uh, uh, things. That usually you, even in private practice, have a little niche that you do. And so uh, I tend to do more head and neck surgery, rhinology, and laryngology, and a little less ear surgery. Um, and thyroid surgery is one of the things that uh, I especially do. Um, but treating allergies, you know, the one problem with uh, ENT is that. Half the people think you're an EMT, and I have to say there's there's a big difference between EMT and ENT in terms of uh, about uh, 12 years of training. But uh, uh, having gone through the 26th grade, which is really what it worked out to, um, uh, and only knowing up a little bit in debt, uh, but you get out and everybody thinks, oh, you're an ENT, you must deal with allergy, uh, which is true. Allergy is a big part of, of uh, what we do, but uh, uh, but there's a whole surgical specialty for ENT. ENT is the one specialty, you take urology, there's both a nephrologist who handles the medical aspects of the kidney, and then there's a urologist who handles the surgical aspects of the kidney and ureter and bladder and, and all that. And, and ENT is the one specialty that kind of handles both the medical and surgical aspects. There's, there's, there are audiologists, but on the other hand, there's no MD that handles hearing disorders and loss of taste and sense of smell and, and uh, uh, salivary disorders and, and things like that. So we manage some things medically and, and some things surgically. Uh, so I'll go through a few of, uh, let's see, how are we doing on time? Maybe we're three, doing pretty well. I'll go through a few cases now. Uh, I will say uh, these are surgical pictures and some of them are big surgical pictures. So it's not to put up here to make anybody gross out. Uh, to tell you the truth, if you ask my family, I was the one voted that, no, they didn't think I would make it through medical school at all just because I had a sensitive stomach. I mean, uh, growing up, if my brother was sick and threw up, I threw up. I mean, I couldn't stand it. Anybody throw up in the room or I'd start throwing up. And I. Couldn't stand bad smells. Uh, I got out of cleaning up the dog's yard uh, when I was a kid because I just go out there and start throwing up every time I'd try and pick up dog poop. And, and, uh, and so I had this reputation even in my own family that I had a sensitive stomach and didn't like sights and didn't like blood and, and uh, didn't like bad smells, didn't like to get dirty. And, and they just didn't think that there was any way I would make it through, through medical school. But uh, so I was, I was squeamish uh, uh, for a bit. But I'll have to say that uh, really that wasn't ever a factor even in medical school. Uh, Certainly there were some bad smells and bad things you never wanted to see, but, uh, but on the whole, I uh, got through it. And I can tell you if I can get through it, then, then, then anybody really can. Um, this is a lady that showed up to the uh, Providence ER. And I should also mention if this is being recorded, all the patients have given uh, permission for their pictures to be shown in this presentation. Uh, <clears throat> this lady showed up short of breath. Let's see. Anybody see what's wrong with this test X-ray? Uh, see this thing here? That shouldn't be there. So you've got lung fields, you got the trachea, which is way pushed over here. You've got this big thing sitting here, uh, a mediastinum, that's called the mediastinum, mediastinal mass that's causing tracheal deviation and actually tracheal compression and compresses your superior vena cava and, and, and things like that. And that turns out that uh, she's got a large, you can't really see it on her, believe it or not, there's a huge mass over there and you can't see it, but she's got this mass that starts about here and comes down all the way about there. That's her very large, what we call substernal or mediastinal thyroid. And so that requires, usually these big thyroids like this require both ENT and, uh, and cardiothoracic surgery as a combined surgical procedure. So here's a surgical picture. Hopefully it doesn't bother uh, anybody there. Um, <clears throat> but this is a rib spreader. And we're looking up, here's her chin. And so we've got the ribs, here's the mass. Uh, and it's going down. We've got lung tissue here, aortic root right there. And uh, we're just in the process of getting that out. Here we are lifting it up. Uh, again, multi-lobulated mass, the lung has come back over a little bit. And so 
Um, I, my dissection kind of starts right about here. The rest is a heart surgeon to some degree. And then getting out the vocal cord nerves, the trachea, clotted arteries, uh, jugular veins uh, is, is part of our work up there. And then this is me. Actually, once they pushed it up, I was able to deliver it up. And that's uh, pushing from below the aorta up and, and pushing the uh, mass out. And here's this big, big thyroid, which is about the size of the largest potato you can imagine uh, uh, in there. So that's a large uh, benign goiter of the thyroid, uh, something like this. Uh, and this is a fellow who was a little bit of a simpleton and kind of been a shut-in for a long time, lived with his mother. And, and uh, uh, all he could say was, mama says it's my tonsils, but I don't think it's my tonsils. And it was not his tonsils, unfortunately. Uh, probably a little bit of a case of a neglect, but nonetheless, this large tumor, uh, uh, which actually is a thyroid cancer, let's see. This is his CAT scan. And uh, I'll still point with this. I guess I'm only pointing on one screen, but you can see the trachea. Here's his spine. Uh, the trachea is pushed way over, and, and the bulk of his neck is this huge tumor, uh, has a, a tremendous blood supply. So it's, it's uh, uh, spawned these arteries that aren't normally there to feed this giant tumor. So. Uh, so he underwent embolization to block these arteries on, on day one. And then on day two, uh, underwent surgical resection. And he had so much extra skin. We took a, a strip of skin here. This is the tumor, uh, very large tumor uh, of the, the head and neck. And, uh, um, and then once that's removed, uh, there's chest, there's nipple, there's chin and shoulder here and here. Um, and so you can see here's the aorta giving off the uh, subclavian artery to the carotid artery up here. Here's the recurrent laryngeal nerve that works the uh, vocal cord. We've taken out the jugular vein and tied off the uh, subclavian artery here. And jugular vein on this side is still open. That's what you can barely see right there. This is lung tissue here. Um, so that took a, a little time. Uh, but those kind of operations are usually uh, the 12 to 14 hour ones. Uh, here he is after he's uh, been uh, put back together, and he actually did quite well. I was very happy to have that uh, large, almost 14-pound tumor taken off. And then I'll do one more of these. That was a papillary thyroid cancer. This is a different type called a follicular thyroid cancer. Uh, and again, this lady had not uh, sought care for quite some time. You can see it's a, a huge uh, tumor uh, pushing the airway and the larynx way over to the side. Uh, there are some lymph nodes around. And again, big vessels. Um, and so her picture, similarly, uh, this is lifting the tumor up. And uh, so this is the aortic root here, uh, tumor. And this is around the uh, uh, brachiocephalic vein. And uh, then this is with the tumor out. You can see a little more clearly now, this is the aortic root. Here comes the... Uh, lung tissue and the superior vena cava. This is the atrium. This is the uh, lingula of left lung. Here's her carotid artery uh, coming up in here. Trachea is right here. Carotid and jugular are still intact on this side. We almost always have to take the jugular vein on the, the side that's involved. But you can take one jugular vein without too much trouble. If you take two, they can have problems, uh, and lose their vision, have bad headaches, get tremendous facial swelling. Eventually, they usually do OK. but. Uh, so about the time you start to think, well, that is something else to be able to take out those size tumors and, and uh, amazing medical technology. You look back and in 1785, uh, Dr. Hunter removed even a bigger tumor off a guy who lived. Uh, uh, it's amazing that they could do that back, uh, back then, what, what we do today. But it also is humbling that that, that happened. So, uh, so that's sort of the massiveness of head and neck cancers. I didn't show you laryngectomy, uh, creating the, the stoma hole. Um, one of the more common things that, that we do, although getting less common with the advance of uh, chemotherapy and radiation, uh, taking care of ear cancers. This is an ear cancer that had gone quite a ways and actually not too difficult to, uh, um, to take off. Uh, you leave a, hopefully a little bit of an ear canal and you lose about 10 to 15 decibels of hearing without an ear, um, but you can survive without an ear. And uh, uh, had she wanted reconstruction, there's ways to reconstruct it, but she wanted to just leave it off. But uh, uh, so larger ear cancers and then uh, larger facial tumors. Uh, 
This was done uh, both with uh, regular resection as well as Mohs and reconstructed with the facial flap. I wish I had the, the uh, final pictures. He actually did quite well with the flap, but uh, I didn't put those in the, this, this talk. Uh, so those are cancerous conditions, uh, non-cancerous conditions. Uh, uh, <clears throat> now, if you ever go to crickets, I don't know if people still go to crickets or not, but uh, if you ever walk in front of the dartboard, uh, you have to be careful uh, because uh, this, this person was doing actually not a difficult injury to, uh, to repair. You pull it out and put a stitch on either side, and that's really about all you have to do. Cover for antibiotics, probably a tetanus shot, and, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, Bigger things happen, like fish hooks. Uh, and, uh, those can be bad, especially with their intervascular structures. This is actually a da more dangerous injury than that. Uh, but, uh, but those are the kinds of things that reconstruction, uh, typically trauma call. Uh, at our institution, trauma call for facial trauma was split three ways. One, one week, oral maxillofacial would do it. One week, plastics would do it. And one week, ENT would do it. So, Every third week we were on for any kind of facial trauma, facial fracture, facial cut, laceration, anything like that. We get called for airway. This is a uh, one, or 18 month old who is making a noise and brought into the, uh, the ER. You can see that they've got this very dangerous situation of a, a large screw sitting right over uh, the airway. And uh, it's actually up in the back of the nose. And uh, so strange situation, uh, airway foreign bodies are, are very, uh, Difficult, some of our most uh, tense moments is, is taking simple things out and a kid just accidentally swallows something and uh, gets into the wrong spot. And those can be uh, some of the more uh, white knuckle times for, for us. Now, this is an interesting case of a 44 year old who uh, was also mentally challenged, had a tendency to get into the medicine cabinet uh, and take pills and overdose accidentally. And the family was so used to this happening, I don't know why they didn't lock the medicine cabinet, but they would take a spatula and try and induce vomiting and he would vomit up whatever he kind of overdosed on and they went on their way. Well, this time they couldn't quite get him to, to vomit with the spatula. And eventually after several of his family members trying to get him to vomit, they, they gave up, but then he became sort of untunded, didn't respond to them, was having trouble breathing. And they brought him to the ER and this is the CAT scan that was obtained. And you can see something here that shouldn't be here. And uh, that was very confusing. Actually his airway is fairly patent. This is the esophagus, there's the, the trachea all the way down. But you can see this, this foreign body here. And so take him to the OR to see what that is. You can kind of make out something here deep in the, the throat. Uh, and it turns out that they were gagging with the spatula and somehow the spatula made it up into the back of his throat. No one noticed for, for a couple hours. And sure enough, that's where the, the, the spatula was. But uh, those kinds of odd stories, uh, <laughs> more common than you think. So I won't talk a lot about ear surgery. Uh, uh, of course, we usually say no Q-tips in the ENT world, but uh, uh, I find it's very difficult to talk to people about Q-tips. Uh, if you like to use them and you love that little eargasm that it causes uh, uh, when you use your, your Q-tip, uh, most of the time you cannot talk a person out of getting up their Q-tips. So uh, I sort of have stopped talking about doing it, tell people it's not a good idea, but uh, uh, surgery on the ear bones is actually one of the most intricate things. And frankly, having looked at all that aneurysm stuff and when I wanted to be a neurosurgeon, I'll have to say it's actually even more intricate to try and replace ear bones. These are the three ear bones, hammer, uh, anvil, and, and stirrup, or the malleus, incus, and the stapes. And, uh, and ear bone surgery is really uh, one of the most uh, uh, intricate types of surgeries that there is. Um, ENT has some popular connotations. Uh, you know, several of our presidents died of, of ENT conditions. Hopefully we all know Abraham Lincoln, which one do you think he, had penetrating temporal bone trauma. Yeah, he was shot actually in the temporal bone right back below here, which is ear trauma. And so ENTs are usually consulted on temporal bone trauma because the facial nerve and the balance system and hearing is all involved. Uh, <clears throat> Ulysses S. Grant uh, had a very unpleasant death of basal tongue cancer before uh, chemotherapy and radiation, which is a, not a good way to go just because it, they produce bad smelling, fungating things that you can't swallow or breathe and eventually you suffocate or asphyxiate. So that's a, that's a bad way to go. Grover Cleveland uh, had a rucous carcinoma of the palate and he was one of the first presidents to have a true operation. They did it on a yacht and he survived it and that didn't actually kill him. He, uh, he survived his rucous carcinoma. And we know it's a rucous carcinoma because the, can't, the uh, tumor is still in the Smithsonian and they've gone back and analyzed it a few years ago and were able to do gene studies on everything else. And he had a 
sure enough, a low grade uh, Rucus carcinoma, which is why it was a successful operation because that's a very low metastasizing rate and then fairly easy to, to take out. So, uh, and then George Washington, it's a little more ambiguous, but we think that he had a either tonsillar abscess or a lateral pharyngeal abscess. And, uh, and of course, before antibiotics, that was usually a, um, a fatal condition. And of course, he was bled many times too, so that that didn't help him out any. Um, but that's how the, the presidents go. One other source of ENT in popular media, everybody recognize that? Star Wars, right? The uh, interrogation droid, I think it's called. Uh, looks kind of like a 1970s space age type of thing. But if you look at this thing right here, that's actually uh, an old tonsil comb. That's what was used to take out tonsils from about 1920 to about 1950. Uh, this device, you'd take the tonsil through this little thing, you'd squeeze that and it would guillotine off the tonsil and that's how you could take out a tonsil. So for some reason they thought putting this old antique tonsil comb on the side here would make it look more, more space age. Uh, this is just a regular surgical clamp and this is an obstetrical forceps to deliver a baby. Uh, and so I'm not sure quite how they uh, uh, got the idea to attach these things along with a 1950s hypodermic needle to this thing to make it look uh, uh, space agey at the time, but that, that's about all they did. I mentioned laryngology and uh, um, study of the vocal cord. Uh, and you know, I don't know how many of you have seen a video strobe. Let's see, now how am I gonna get this to go? But this is a, called a stroboscopy of the video, the uh, vocal cords. That's the epiglottis. Takes a second to kind of get someone to keep ready for that. So I, I just think this is so cool. Uh, you know, the, the vocal cord here, his voice is probably vibrating about 150, 160 hertz. So 150, 160 times a second. And by strobing the light just at the right time, it can turn that 150 times a second into about one time a second. So that's why you can see that, that vocal cord going, going back and forth. And, uh, and really that's, that's how we kind of analyze voices is the stroboscopy so that we can slow everything down so the eye can see uh, what's happening so fast that you otherwise couldn't. You know, the vocal cord itself makes a very weird sound. If, if you hear the vocal cord itself, it's kind of when you do vocal fry, if you, uh, it's a flapping low sound. If you've ever heard anybody like who plays the trombone or trumpet or tuba just with the mouthpiece and they buzz their lips and it kind of makes that high pitch uh, buzz, that's, that's what the vocal cord sounds like. Of course, then you take that mouthpiece and you put it on a trumpet or a trombone or French horn or tuba, and all of a sudden you get the sound of that instrument. Well, that's actually, most of our sound comes from throat, nose, head. Uh, so the vocal cords make this weird buzzing sound and you put the rest of this instrument on top of it and that's what, that's what makes your voice. So I just think it's fascinating to be able to, to see stroboscopy and, and uh, you see a little mucus building up and uh, see how the cord lengthens. And, and uh, this is a normal example. He doesn't have any pathology. I could spend a whole lecture on vocal cord pathology, but, uh, uh, but that's cool stuff. And you see the way the larynx tenses and, and, uh, and goes from there. Okay. Uh, obviously a very well-trained singer too. Who's been singing for us. And then there's weird things that uh, nowadays we're seeing in ENT, uh, piercing uvulas, and this is called a conchal resection, which uh, hasn't hit in Waco very much, but in other places, uh, very tough to repair this if they decide they want to undo it. Uh, it's one of the most difficult things to, to fix. But uh, uh, almost done here, I'll just give you a few last thoughts on, on medical school. Number one, as I'll say that I, I am very blessed to be in, in really what for most time has been the most honored profession. Uh, surveys in the United States, uh, physician typically is at the top of the list for the most honored profession. There was a time right around 9-11, probably when most of you were born, where the first responder uh, displaced physicians as the most honored profession in the United States. But then a few years later, it flipped back. And so uh, uh, it, is, it is a true blessing to me uh, to be a physician. It's an honored profession. And, and, uh, and I think if you're considering it, to, you're to be commended. Uh, 
Uh, it truly is one of the, the most uh, rewarding callings that, that you can have. It is hard and grueling. Uh, I won't say that it wasn't easy. I went to a very old school program that work hour restrictions didn't exist. And, and uh, I lived three quarters of a mile away from the hospital, but there were times I got too tired to even drive that and had to stop uh, two tenths of a mile from where I started and sleep for a little while because I couldn't make it home. Um, and I could have uh, amazed my wife because I could fall asleep on command. I could say, watch this and go, and just be out. And, and uh, after being in the hospital for 36 hours or so, uh, you could fall asleep on, on demand. But, uh, uh, but it was an amazing time, learned a heck of a lot. I, I look on, back on it, uh, even the, the uh, professors and, and some of the surgeons I worked with who were, uh, you know, kind of the north end of a southbound horse. I mean, they were, there were some, some bad characters, but, uh, but I learned from them all and, uh, and it was kind of a trial by fire. One thing you probably have heard and I agree with is it's not a good way to get rich. Uh, if you're looking to be rich, a, a doctor and physician is not the way to, to go these days. Uh, I do think we have to watch very carefully how much debt people get into. Uh, there are students who are graduating uh, and entering residency with more debt that they're going to be able to handle. Uh, so it is something that you need to think about. Uh, there are much better ways to get rich than, uh, than, than entering medicine. But if it, is, uh, if it is a calling for you, if it's an interest and, and, uh, and something that tweaks your um, fancy, then I would say there, there really is no better profession. I would do it again in a heartbeat. I uh, happen to look into what I think is the best pro uh, profession and not only that, but the best specialty. I'll, I'll say that uh, I would do ENT again if I had to. Um, and it has been extremely rewarding for me. Uh, part of that is finding the correct balance and the correct balance between life and, and family and, and God and um, everything that goes into life. I, you know, I, it's still a work in progress for how I deal with that. But uh, we all have to find that in, in different ways. And that's really one of the challenges too of being a physician, especially being a surgeon. Uh, I've prided myself that uh, even as my kids grew up, I was uh, uh, a surgeon that could usually make most of their events and soccer games and, and birthday parties and, and, uh, and, and still have a life like a dad should, as well as be a, a surgeon in private practice. So uh, that's been very rewarding for me. So with that, I think I've uh, got a few minutes left. I'll be happy to answer questions if there are any, but I've Really do appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. Hope uh, at least tweaked a little interest and uh, uh, maybe hopefully didn't discuss it too many people, but I, I think it's fascinating and uh, happy to take your questions. But thank you for having me very much. So. Anything, you can ask anything. I don't, I don't care what, uh, uh, what you got. Oh, no question. Oh, one question here. Yeah. Yeah, ENT uh, had just changed actually. It used to be two years of general surgery and then four years of ENT when I started. I got into the, one of the modern programs that was one year of general surgery and four years of ENT. So it's a five year program. And uh, there are currently seven board certified specialty uh, fellowships out of ENT. Uh, now I have to go back to almost that slide if I can get them all right. There's pla uh, facial plastics. 80% of the facial plastics is done by ENT as opposed to plastic surgeons in the, in the, in the country. Uh, pediatrics, laryngology, rhinology, um, head and neck oncology. There is allergy, uh, otology, and neurotology skull base if you, if you uh, count that. So people who are doing the big ear tumors and kind of the the, the brainstem resections of, of big ear tumors, usually in conjunction with neurosurgery, that's a neuroautology, uh, skull based type of thing. Yeah. Oof. Uh, do I have any advice? Well, you know, I kind of thought when you transitioned from high school to college, there was that kind of whoa, but then you kind of got it and it made sense. And now it seems like second nature probably most of you. And I thought the same thing for medical school. There was the first little bit of, oh my gosh, you know, this is something else, but then well into it, uh, it became second nature and, and, uh, and, and you adjust to it quite well. Uh, um, you know, I think there's uh, a lot of different philosophies now by, by medical school. If you look at the differences in high schools, you know, high schools maybe take all your high schools that y'all went to and there may be that much difference. And you take colleges, excluding some that are, if you, if you take four year, uh, uh, institutions, there may be that much difference. And really in medical schools, there's about that much difference. I mean, uh, they all have tremendous uh, differences in how they 
teach and, and you can find different curriculum and, and some want you in the clinic the very first day or an MS1 and, and some put it later, uh, you know, that kind of stuff uh, may seem important. And, and if that really is important to you, that's maybe how you can select a, a medical school. But in reality, no medical school is turning out uh, um, bad students. And, and uh, uh, so I think you, you know, you go where you can get the best deal or you can be happy where the people seem to, to, to fit you. Uh, that's ultimately uh, Southwestern just seemed to be a right fit. I really liked the, the people there and uh, got along with them. Uh, I interviewed at Johns Hopkins and, and, and wore cowboy boots to a mixer. And I just, I was the talk of a mixer. I know when it showed up in cowboy boots to a, it was, it was quite casual, it was a jeans type of thing. But uh, uh, back then, the, the Johns Hopkins just didn't get a lot of cowboy boots. And I knew right away that this is not going to be the place for me. I mean, I, I was the talk of the, the, the mixer that night. So I had to adjust to that. But uh, uh, you have to go where you want to go. So uh, um, if that helps. But... Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Uh, especially here in Waco, Texas, too. Uh, as a general ear, nose, and throat, about 60% of my operations are on kids, uh, tubes and tonsils, and a few of the other congenital abnormalities. Uh, and I do like that part. I do a lot of pediatric work. And, and uh, I'll tell you that no one can put your trust in you more than a parent who lets you operate on their kid. That is the, the ultimate uh, sign of trust and, and uh, responsibility that you have. So, uh, um, but 60% of the operations I do are, are uh, tube tonsil type of things. Uh, about another 20% uh, is head and neck cancer. And then there's a few other sinus surgery being the, the rest of that uh, and some phonosurgery as well. So. Uh, you can, and that, that, that varies. Uh, um, there are people in private practice in a little bigger communities. Certainly Austin has, has uh, people that are not necessarily rhinologists, but just do sinus surgery and some just for ear surgery. And, and uh, so it depends on how you want to divvy it up. And, and you can really tailor make your practice what you want to even out, uh, uh, whether you're fellowship trained or not. But uh, uh, if you're gonna go do the, the bigger things on any of those, I don't do free flaps. Uh, you know, if you've got to move a hip tissue up to replace a face or, or uh, take the radial forearm to redo the jaw or the fibula to redo the jaw, those are called free flap transfers. And, and I don't do those here in Waco. So there's a limit to what I do head and neck oncology wise, but we do tongue tumors and laryngeal tumors and, and tonsil tumors and, and things like that. Anything else? One more, yeah. Well, uh, so MD PhD is a medical scientist training program where you did two years of medical school and then you went and you did your PhD uh, for three and then you came back for the last two years of medical school. That's how it was arranged when I was there. Um, now, a lot of people were not finishing their PhD work in three years. That was one of the, the issues that, uh, trying to get them to finish in three years was a real, real challenge. Uh, and, um, and so then, uh, <clears throat> and, and you are paid throughout that time as a graduate student, you know? Uh, and so really the first two years were exactly the same as, as medical school. Um, some of those folks had been a little bit further away from the clinical rotations. Uh, so that when they came back for their third and fourth years after being away for three or four years during their PhD, they had a little bit more of a catch up to do. Um, and then I, I certainly have several friends who went that route. Uh, um, one is a chief of pulmonology at, at uh, Washington St. Louis, and, and he, uh, his PhD work is on immunotherapy for lung uh, conditions and aspergillosis and things like that. And so he is kind of combining the benchtop research with clinical practice. But uh, um, I, I think it's very difficult and from what I've seen it's very difficult to get maximum out of both degrees. There are people who do it and, and uh, it's a fantastic training, um, but I would say probably at least 60%, maybe even 75% of the people who have that dual training are still kind of relying on one of those degrees. Uh, and so uh, it, it certainly is a niche training, uh, but it's a fantastic training. And if your uh, goal is to go out there and finally be the one that, that uh, uh, cures cancer or, or uh, you know, Here's one of the major things vexing us. I think it'll probably come from people who have that kind of training. So I do value it very much, but it just, it just wasn't for me. That, I think that's it. So we'll end up here. Well, again, thank you very much and uh, uh, happy to talk afterwards. So. Thank you, Dr. Hall.
Dr. Hahn will be around to answer any of your more personal questions after the meeting. And here's Sarah. All right, guys, um, I'm going to put the QR code for the attendance up in just one second. I ask that if you came into the meeting more than 10 minutes after it started, that you do not scan that. Our officers are, have been around the room the whole time, so they'll know if you came in late. So I just ask you guys to be honest in that. Um, the other thing that I want to tell you is don't forget to pick up your general member shirts before you head out tonight. Um, Pardis and her committee are going to be over here giving them out. You need proof of um, that payment of dues, and you can find that in your email. Whenever you can show that to one of your committee members, they will give you your shirt. And yeah, they're really cute. Um, the last thing I want to tell you guys about is the post meeting social. It's right after this outside of the atrium. Um, there's pizza. You guys should go. The one thing that we ask is that if you go to that social, that you stay for the entire duration, especially if you're going to eat the pizza and everything. We want you to really um, engage in that event. So make sure that you're staying the whole time if you are stopping by that social. All right. With that, we'll go ahead and put up the QR code. Dr. Holland's going to be up here as well as our entire executive board in case you have any questions after this. And yeah, thank you guys so much for stopping by. Have a great fall break.